Visceral fat is this type of fat around the organs and inside muscles. It's one of the biggest contributors to metabolic disorders such as insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, which ultimately leads to heart disease and atherosclerosis. Every one of us has a little bit of visceral fat, but we can't see it because it's around the organs, not under the skin. And even if you're otherwise lean and healthy, you might still have too much visceral fat. For overall health, you want to have your visceral fat below 500 grams, which you can measure with a DEXA scan. In this video, I'm going to share with you how I reduced my visceral fat from 350 grams to 50 grams, which is a very good result. So I've done two DEXA scans over the last year, and I've seen my visceral fat decrease from 359 grams to 54 grams, which is a 300 gram difference. The average healthy person between the age of 20 to 30 has been seen to have about 550 grams of visceral fat. Fat. Men have about twice as much visceral fat as women, 500 versus 250 grams. Unhealthy obese people have over 1500 grams of visceral fat. The average person in their 40s has about 1000 grams of visceral fat. And visceral fat appears to increase with age because of the age-related fat gain and lack of exercise. For reference, Brian Johnson's DEXA scan results showed he had visceral fat of 0.42 liters, which if you convert into grams is about 378 grams. Paul Saladino's recent DEXA scan results showed he had 0.3 pounds of visceral fat, which is 136 grams. So how did I do it? How did I decrease my visceral fat so much? The first big change was me losing weight. I lost about 2-3 to three kilograms of weight between November and July, which is decent but not a massive difference. I was already lean and you can't really see a massive difference in my leanness between 10 months. And I lost 100% body fat as shown by my DEXA scan because I also gained 0.2 kilograms of lean mass in my arms and legs. So this weight loss came 100% from body fat. So I lost body fat both from the subcutaneous area under the skin as well as the visceral fat. How did I lose the fat? Just by eating a bit fewer calories and doing more exercise. I eat a higher carb, lower fat diet with vegetables, fruits, berries, fish, eggs, some meat, dairy, potatoes, etc. It's similar to a Mediterranean diet. However, I don't think that eating slightly less calories was the biggest reason why I lost so much visceral fat because I was already eating this diet before. The second big thing I did was reduce my methionine intake. Methionine is an essential amino acid you get from protein. The highest sources of methionine are animal protein like meat, eggs, dairy. There are studies in rodents that methionine restriction lowers visceral fat independent of calorie intake. And there's a lot of evidence that methionine restriction in animals extends lifespan. But this phenomenon is because of achieving balance with glycine. Glycine supplementation mimics the lifespan extension effects of methionine restriction. If you get higher amounts of glycine, then you don't need to restrict your methionine that much for the longevity benefits. But it appears that reducing methionine intake independently also lowers visceral fat. I did reduce my methionine intake over the last 10 months quite a lot, and I was eating much less meat and eggs, maybe once or twice a week. I did continue consuming dairy every day and fish like every other day. So I don't know exactly how big of a role reducing my methionine intake had in reducing my visceral fat. But it did play a role, I'm pretty sure of that. In humans with metabolic syndrome, 16 weeks of methionine restriction, 2 mg per kilogram per day of methionine compared to a control diet, 33 mg per kilogram per day of methionine has been seen to improve insulin sensitivity, increase fat oxidation, and reduce lipid content in the liver independent of weight loss. So methionine restriction might reduce liver fat in humans as well. The interesting thing here is that Paul Saladino eats quite a lot of methionine because of his animal-based diet, whereas Brian Johnson, who eats a plant-based diet or vegan diet, he consumes almost no methionine from his diet. The difference between Paul Saladino and Brian Johnson is also that Paul Saladino has a much higher glycine intake because of the organ meats, whereas Brian Johnson also has a very low intake of glycine from his diet and he doesn't take a lot of supplements for glycine either. He only takes 1200 milligrams of glycine per day whereas Paul Saladino gets a lot more from his tendon meats. Whereas me, personally, I have a lower methionine intake, I have less methionine intake than Paul Saladino, but I also have a much higher glycine intake than Paul Saladino because of supplementing glycine. I take about 10 to 15 grams of glycine per day as a supplement. In older adults, they have found that low plasma glycine levels are a marker of visceral adiposity, independent of sex, age, body composition, or chronic diseases. Serum glycine is also negatively associated with intermolecular 
muscular adipose tissue, which is the fat inside the muscles. So the key here appears to be that you need to be on a lower methionine intake and on a higher glycine intake to see a dramatic reduction in your visceral fat. The third thing I think played a role was aerobic high intensity exercise. Aerobic exercise has been seen to reduce visceral fat and a 2012 meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials found that aerobic exercise was more effective in reducing visceral fat than resistance training. And there are studies indicating that high intensity interval training is superior to low intensity exercise for reducing visceral fat and abdominal obesity. So during this time I have shifted my exercise more towards aerobic exercise as well as incorporating more high intensity aerobic exercise. I've done much less resistance training than last year and I've done a lot more cardio this year. Based on the evidence, doing more cardio and doing more high intensity cardio appears to be more superior for reducing visceral fat than doing resistance training. During this time, I was doing about two to three times a week of zone two cardio for 60 minutes. And once a week, I did high intensity intervals with the four x four Norwegian protocol. Four minutes of high intensity at 80 to 90% of max heart rate and four minutes of 50 to 60% of max heart rate repeated for four rounds. This hit protocol is quite brutal, but it is one of the most effective ways to increase your VO2 max, and it probably has a very beneficial effect on reducing visceral fat as well. The final big thing that reduced my visceral fat was probably green tea intake. I started adding two to three cups of green tea every day, whereas previously I was drinking only one cup. There's a 2012 randomized controlled trial showing that catagen enriched green tea for 12 weeks resulted in greater visceral fat loss than in the placebo group. Another 2009 study found that green tea catagens enhanced the loss of abdominal fat from exercise. The green tea group lost more fat mass across the board compared to the control group. They lost more visceral fat as well as more subcutaneous fat as well. So the total visceral fat loss from green tea isn't massive, but if you combine green tea with exercise, you'll see greater loss in visceral fat than if you do just exercise alone. Basically, if you combine hit cardio with green tea, you're gonna see massive reduction in visceral fat. And regular coffee has also been seen to support visceral fat loss, but my coffee intake stayed the same between this time period two cups per day. These are the main things that I did that resulted in visceral fat loss. But obviously there's a lot of basic things as well that will support losing visceral fat, which is a good thing. Here are the biggest factors that increase visceral fat. Added refined sugars, high fructose corn syrup, alcohol intake, ultra processed foods, trans fats, a high fat diet, inadequate sleep, sleep apnea, chronically elevated cortisol levels, low testosterone and low DHEA levels, as well as supraphysiological testosterone levels, such as when you use steroids or other anabolics. When it comes to things like fat intake and sugar intake, then the total calorie intake is the most important thing. You could still eat some amounts of sugar and still see a reduction in your visceral fat if you're in a calorie deficit and you lose weight across the board. It's just that if you're very dialed in with your nutrition already and you don't see a reduction in your visceral fat, then and reducing the sugar and reducing the fat intake will probably move the needle. I'm personally not on a zero sugar diet. I'm getting over 200 grams of carbs every day and my visceral fat is extremely low. And my blood sugar markers like hemoglobin A1c and fasting insulin are also very low. I don't drink alcohol at all. I haven't drank alcohol pretty much for the last 10 years, which I do think has a major role in reducing visceral fat. If you're lean and you're exercising regularly and you eat a healthy diet, but you still drink some alcohol, then you're just gonna carry a little bit too much visceral fat. That's pretty much the truth. And eliminating the alcohol will Will reduce your visceral fat. I think alcohol is way worse for increasing visceral fat than sugar or fat intake. It's just much more harmful for your liver and it's going to increase your visceral fat way more than any kind of processed food would. And lastly, chronic stress is also linked to visceral fat, but I'm not living a stress-free life. I run my own business. I work pretty much 12 hours a day in front of the computer. I have several employees. So I think the key here is being lean and adjusting some of the dietary macros to reduce the visceral fat. And stress isn't that big of an obstacle. What about the things that reduce visceral fat. Here are the biggest factors. Intermittent fasting or alternative fasting, as well as the fasting mimicking diet, has been seen to reduce visceral fat. Get seven to eight hours of sleep. Calorie restriction combined with exercise. Polyphenol rich vegetables and foods like olive oil, leafy greens, berries, and some fruit. Phytochemicals like berberine, curcumin, and capsaicin. And lastly, a higher fiber and higher protein intake has been found to reduce visceral fat. In terms of the hierarchy of importance, then just losing weight is at the top. If you're carrying 20 kilos extra weight, then losing that weight will reduce your visceral fat as well. So you don't need to micromanage all the other nuances. 
if you're already lean, you can see your abs, you're exercising and you eat like a relatively healthy diet, then you can start to micromanage these things a bit more. Like, okay, I'm going to look into some supplements. I'm going to try to do more hit cardio. I'm going to drink green tea or I'm going to increase my glycine intake, etc. But if you have 20, 30 kilos of extra weight to lose, then just lose the weight and you will see improvements in your visceral fat scores. But how do you know how much visceral fat you have and how much do you need to lose? Like I said, the DEXA scan is the most accurate way to measure your body composition, including bone density, muscle mass and visceral fat mass. DEXA scans are quite easy to find in big cities, but not every country has them. There are some easy ways to assess your visceral fat as well to approximate it, but it's not the most accurate way. You basically want to measure your waist circumference. A high waist circumference is a risk factor for heart disease and it typically indicates a higher amount of belly fat, which is an indicator of visceral fat. The higher the waist circumference, the higher the risk of heart disease and mortality in both men and women. The optimal waist circumference for men is below 85 centimeters and for women it's 65 centimeters. Above 95 and 75 centimeters for women, the risk starts to increase exponentially. So measuring your waist circumference is very easy and convenient. You can do it at your home, but it's not 100% perfect. There's also what's called the waist to hip ratio, which is also useful. You basically measure your waist circumference and then your hip circumference. And then you divide your waist circumference with your hip circumference and you get a number. You want your waist to be narrower than your hips. If your waist is wider than your hips, then it means you have too much belly fat and too much visceral fat. The lowest risk of heart disease is seen with a waist to hip ratio below 0.95 for men and 0.80 for women. With a waist to hip ratio above 1 for men and 0.86 for women, you would see the highest risk. So pretty much get your waist circumference as low as possible for both men and women. And your hips would ideally be always wider than your waist. Overall, too much visceral fat is bad for your health because it's a sign of metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance, and organ fat. A healthy and safe amount of visceral fat is less than 500 grams or about one pound. However, ideally you want it to be closer to 100 to 200 grams, which is less than a half pound. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.